everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Virtual Gaithersburg Book Festival. I'm Amy McGuire, your host for this presentation. Before we get started, I'd like to ask you to support these authors by purchasing their books from our wonderful bookseller, Politics and Prose, one of America's premier independent bookstores. You'll find purchase links in the presentation description. Given all that we've been through over the past year, it's so important to support local jobs and the local economy. I also want to extend a big thank you to our 2021 featured sponsor, the David and Michael Blair Family Foundation, for their generous support. Okay, let's get started. Today's presentation features two outstanding science fiction novelists here to discuss the most recent additions to their wildly successful series. A Desolation Called Peace is a spectacular space opera sequel to Arkady Martin's genre reinventing Hugo award-winning debut a memory called Empire. Arkady is a speculative fiction writer and a historian of the Byzantine Empire under the name Dr. Anna Linden Weller. Under both names, she writes about border politics, narrative and rhetoric, risk communication, and the edges of the world. She is currently a policy advisor for the New Mexico Energy, Minerals, and Natural Resources Department, where she works on climate change mitigation energy grid modernization, and resiliency planning. Karen Osborne continues her science fiction action and adventure series, The Memory War, with Engines of Oblivion, the sequel to Architects of Memory. Karen is a speculative fiction writer and visual storyteller. She is a Nebula finalist and graduate of Viable Paradise and has won awards for her news and opinion writing. Karen's short fiction appears in Uncanny, Fireside, Escape Pod, Beneath Ceaseless Skies, and more. The conversation about these fascinating books is being moderated by Andrea M. Pauly. Andrea lives and writes in Washington, D.C. Her work has appeared in Asimov's Science Fiction, Clark's World, and Lady Churchill's Rosebud Wristlet. Andrea attended Clarion West in 2017 and has forever wondered how the universe works and what's in the space where the universe isn't. Welcome, Arkady, Karen, and Andrea. Well, I'm really excited to be here talking with Karen Osborne and Arkady Martin um, about Engines of Oblivion and A Desolation Called Peace. I really enjoyed reading these books and your books before, of course. Um, in the next 45 minutes or so, I hope we get a chance to talk about your books and uh, your life as a writer, and also to talk, um, of course, to hear a reading. Um, and uh, I, I uh, wanted to get started by telling you who my favorite super secondary character is. Not my favorite first character of yours, main character, because I loved all of them, and I'm not gonna give anything away. Any spoilers, I hope, are ones that you two are responsible for and not me, um, but my, favorite secondary character in um, Engines of Oblivion was Natalie Chan's dad. This, <laughs> yeah. This poor guy, he can not <laughs> great. Like just, I'm not gonna go into all of his bad decision-making, but he, I just felt so bad for him. I, he didn't even have a name, but there we are. He was my favorite super secondary character. I was like, I hope somewhere out there, that guy is living by a beach and like hit the lotto. <laughs> um, in in um, Arkady's, <laughs> no, don't say it. In Arkady's book, my favorite super secondary character was Five Agate. And she is the, um, the emperor's personal assistant, basically. Yeah. And she just has, like, she keeps getting sent on the worst errands imaginable. And she gets them because she's a mom in part, but also because she's super trustworthy. And same thing, I'm like, I loved her so much. And I'm like, you are always gonna be the best personal assistant uh -huh. Maybe people will remember your name, but maybe not. She Probably had not. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I feel bad for Five Agate a bunch because the the woman she works for, who at this point is the emperor of a giant intergalactic empire, is the sort of person who would go on these very logical but very annoying errands herself if it wouldn't mean an enormous political faux pas. Yes. And therefore she has to send someone she absolutely trusts. Yes, poor lady. Which is 
Yeah, seriously. It, if I was a very different kind of writer, I could write an office drama with Five Agate as the main character and it would probably be good. I, I would read that in a hot second. <laughs> yep. So um, Arkady, can you tell me uh, who your favorite character is uh, in your book? If you can choose oh, one and God. maybe you can do the same. That's a terrible question, um, but yes. So, I mean, I, I, I will tell you all like a, a, an awful secret now, um, which I've been telling people since this book came out. So I guess it's not so much of a secret, but Three Seagrass, who is probably the secondary protagonist in this book and was a major secondary character in the first book is basically a horrible far future version of me at age 26, which says really terrible things about me at age 26, um, including the, oh yeah, I'll totally run off to a different part of the world for reasons so that I don't have to deal with my life. Um, the amount of times I did that. And I love writing her I love her in general because she makes real mistakes, but she's also just incredibly fun to write. Um, she's made of forward momentum and she just does things and damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. Though she does think about them afterward. So there the is that. Dialogue, her internal there. dialogue is wonderful. Thank you. Three Seagrass is my favorite. I'll just have to say that. Three Seagrass has always been my favorite, always probably will be my favorite, just, just right here. So Aww. thank you, thank you, 26-year-old Arkady for being who yeah. you are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so who's your favorite character, Karen? Um, I can't say. I can't say because that's a big fat spoiler. Um, but I will I will tell you my second favorite character. Um if 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 I name this character, then then it would be bad. So uh, I, I'm going to let you all just continue reading how it how, how it is. And um, my 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 favorite character that I can talk to you about is Natalie is Natalie Chan. I she began in Architects of Memory as you know, the 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 funny sidekick. That was her character. She was the friend that was getting my protagonist through um, all of these awful, terrible things that she was dealing with. And then she kind of just started talking by herself and uh, words started coming out of my fingers that, um, and she took on a life of her own to the point where I realized that she had to be the the main character in the second book because, um, well, A, that she put herself there, um, but B, she was just so fun to write and so not even me that, um, I, I feel like I got to be a different person for a while. She she is um, uh, she's working through some issues on her own. She is working through some issues with authority. She works through some issues, of course, with her dad, um, who who does sadly not get to um, live by a beach. Uh, but um, but I just love how she kind of just took on her life of her own and um, and how she has a lot of problems like we do. Like, what do you deal with your bosses? What if what if your bosses are lying to you? What if your life is not what you thought it would be? What do you do when you get hit with a semi-truck full of problems that weren't yours, but now are yours? Because that happens a lot in real life. Um, and, and I just loved, uh, I loved just being in her brain for a while. And it's one of the things I love best about your books, Karen, is that the people in them are so recognizably people with the frustrations and problems of regular people who happen to live in a semi-dystopian corporate hellscape in the future. <laughs> um, so not so different from us really. Uh, but you. I love that. I really, really enjoy the people you make. Thank you. And now both of your books are filled with uh, complex, interesting female characters. Um, this is perhaps not how science fiction has always been. Um, there's a lot of female forward characters in your books. 
um, and main characters and secondary characters. And is there anything you were trying to get across with your portrayal of women in your books? Uh, Karen, do you mind starting? Sure. Um, I grew up uh, Catholic. I grew up very Catholic in a very Catholic family that um, went to mass every week and um, did the whole triduum, the whole shebang. Um, and as you know, the Catholic church is very male dominated at the high ranks. You can only go so far if you work for the church, if you're a woman. Um, but yet my own whole entire childhood was dominated by Catholic women. Um, and we're talking about nuns and sisters and uh, lay people who worked in food pantries. And those are the people that um, really kept, you know, really keep the church going. You, you, you don't have a church without women. Um, and uh, so my, my goal has always been to tell, um, to keep those people uh, at the forefront. Um, and those are the strongest people I know because when you don't have a way forward, when your ambition is cut off and you literally can't go anywhere, um, you go out with it. Um, so one of the things that Natalie does is tries to figure out, she, she, she's trying to go up in, in the book, but she needs to also go out. And so part of Engines of Oblivion is realizing how she can go out instead of up. Um, and I think there's a real big strength in, um, in a, taking a different sort of view on life of understanding that sometimes when you can't go up, you, you have to reach out to other people. Um, so that's how, that's how women are always in my books. And that's how I really want to, um, work to work to see them to have that kind of strength in them and of course they also have guns and you know why not <laughs> why not i really enjoyed um especially like seeing like all female crews like doing uh doing a salvage or like uh you know blowing something up whatever it happens to be it was it was a lot of fun um it was it was there was a lot of camaraderie i don't know if that's a female centric word but that's what i thought of it it can be um there's one, there's one guy on, on board 25, um, and he has absolutely no problems working with a crew of uh, mostly women. Um, in fact, he, he enjoys it. It's a lot of fun, and there's um, no problems there. Uh, Arkady, um, what, you want to talk about uh, sure. how to portray women in your book? So one of the things that I got to do in the whole universe that this book is part of, which I call the Texcalan universe, is there's a lot of queer people and this is actually about women, but I have to start there because I wanted very much to write a world where same sex relationships were completely unremarkable in every single way. That everything interesting about a relationship was who it was with, not what gender they were. Um, and in doing that and making it that level of unremarkable a lot of other things like gender roles get unpicked pretty quickly. And I've always loved as a reader, as a watcher of movies, as a storyteller, I love women in power, um, especially slightly morally ambiguous women in power. Uh, it's a thing I really enjoy experiencing as a consumer of media. And logically it's a thing that I enjoy writing, but in this book specifically, so one of the, there's four point of view characters. One of them is a, basically a general and her name is Nine Hibiscus. And my favorite thing about her, aside from all of the other ways in which she's awesome and deals with some pretty difficult moral choices about being someone who commands soldiers is her friendship with her best friend who happens to be male. And I really wanted to write a friendship between a man and a woman that had nothing to do with sex, that had everything to do with people who connected to each other because they were people who meshed and that that kind of friendship can happen cross gender. It's something I've experienced in my own life. Some of my dearest friends are men and they're, even if there's like some kind of attraction, that's not the point. The point is that we're friends and I want to see more of that in science fiction. So I got to write it and that made me really happy. 
I really, I love that, <clears throat> excuse me, the relationship between the two of them. I can't even talk about it because there's too many spoilers in it. That's yeah, I'm leaving out a lot. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, there was so much I, I loved about that. Um, I don't even know where to start with a world building question with your book. Um, <laughs> uh, and so if you can start uh, and just tell us a little bit about how you develop the world. Like I, I have to admit it was so complex that I didn't even try to figure out like, is this influenced by her, her work on Byzantine culture or what, like, or is this the Mayans? Like, I don't even know. I please yes and tell yes me and yes. Um, tell me what you did. How'd you, how did you stop researching and um, actually start writing all that? Okay. So I have been a professional historian of the Byzantine empire. Um, I'm still a historian, but I don't do it professionally anymore at the moment. So I spent about a decade of my life researching medieval empires and border co conflicts and cultural preservation in the 11th century in the Middle East. Um, this is surprisingly relevant for writing science fiction, it turns out. And I built a lot of the Tex Kalanli empire out of that decade of thinking about these things. Um, so it has a ton of influence from Byzantium. The influence that people tend to catch most obviously though is from a completely different medieval empire, which is the empire of the Mexica, the Aztecs. And one of the reasons that I hold as much imagery and stylistic notes from that medieval empire was that Byzantium is extremely Christian. It's extremely monotheistic. And I didn't want that to be the accompaniment to the imperial ideology that I was building. I wanted it to feel like a universalizing empire, an empire that believes it's the most real place, that places that aren't it aren't really real, um, and that it is singular and unitary. And in many historical empires, that goes along with monotheism. But I didn't want to do that because I didn't want the reference to be that clear or have it feel like, well, are these Greek Orthodox in space? Because I don't even know if the Tixkalan universe is attached to Earth in any way. If it is, it's so far in the back centuries of history that no one remembers or cares. Um, I think they've got like five different origin planet stories. None of them may be Earth. Um, so I wanted to have a completely different religious and ethical structure. And I went looking for one that felt as complicated as imperial and as capable of committing atrocity as the Byzantines were. And combining those two things, plus a lot of American imperialism in the cultural sense was I guess the aesthetic in inspiration for the ideology of the empire. But here's my world building secret. I don't plan very much at all. I know what awesome. things should feel like. I know what they should look like and I know what the experience of reading them should evoke. And then I just have to make sure that I don't contradict myself. So, I never really did the whole world building Bible thing. I have a document full of sketchy notes, which is mostly, all right, I invented a place name. I should remember what I did. But it's mostly improv. Oh my gosh. That's wonderful. And so, okay. Did you have a moment where you're like, wait, they're going to seal packs by slashing themselves and doing it in blood. Like, did you have that um, moment or, or was it, it just obvious? perfectly logical? <laughs> Like, yeah, well, yeah, if there's a, a deep religious history of blood sacrifice and that's pretty far in the past and it doesn't happen very much anymore. Yeah. And it's a little bit squicky for people. How would that diffuse out into the wider culture? Like, okay, blood oaths are in lots of cultures. You can do it in a sanitary way. It's pretty easy. So yeah, why not? I don't know. It, it's, I always feel bad about answering these questions because my answers are 
I just do things and these are this is not a helpful answer for anyone who wants to also do things oh but it's so supportive <laughs> of all the people who just like wing it and that winging it is as far as I can tell winging it is half of the writers and planning is the other half so I yeah, planned some things but world building no I just try to not break my own rules that's wonderful um and so Karen the world in your book is uh a lot about class structure um I mean also in Arkady's book, there's a lot of class structure, mm -hmm. but in Karen, in your book, class structure is, is truly like, whereas in Arkady's book, it's more, it seems more internalized. And I mean, there's, there's a uh, overlays of it throughout the system, but in your book, Karen, it's like, it's, it's the most important thing is, is the class of so how someone is. So there was a lot of class structure, you know, that you had to sort out and this, the company, the idea of a company culture. Can you just talk about how you put all that together? Because I have to tell you, if I had to choose between your world, Karen, and your world, Arkady, I am happy to be a barbarian in Tixkalan culture compared to anything in your world, Karen, because there's a lot of issues there. Please. There, there are a lot of issues, um, and and it's 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 supposed to be issues in a way. It's kind of a, a, a feeding back to our own what we do today with um, the the stretch for the corner office. What would that look like writ large? Um, you want the corner office. You want the vice presidential uh, title. You want to be vice president of whatever it is. There are always fifty or sixty of them at every large company. Um, every company has its own culture, um, and you adapt to the culture as a worker. And the better that you adapt to the culture of your company means um, the better you're going to climb the ladder. It's not necessarily about um, how you. Uh, it's not necessarily about your talent or, or how long you've been there. It's about how well you get along with your boss and how well you fit into the culture going forward. Um, and so a lot of my work is looking at things like, okay, what I, I put things in space to interrogate them um, and yes. to look around <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and to like ask questions and go, okay, what would this look like? Um, I know um, the world building itself comes from, um, uh, it's so so the company is from um and, and I, I mean I'm fascinated by corporations I've only had corporations in my lives for a little for 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 a little amount of time I've mostly been freelancing and um but I did work for the church for a while and and and, and that was super interesting and 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 there's some stuff in there uh, <laughs> but um a lot of the other world building was um just grabbing things from other points in my life and kind of smashing them together like a Katamari ball. Um, so you have uh, you have my fascination with interrogating corporations. Um, um, and there's also the games people play around uh, medical insurance. Um, I had a blood clot once and if I didn't have insurance, I would have 100% have, have died and we would not be having this conversation. Um, so there's that and um, and just putting it all together in one kind of, um, and also there's you know the the fact that we're going to go to Mars, right? And this wasn't true when I first started the book. We're all going to Mars. Who's going to take us there? It's not going to be the government. It's going to be Elon Musk. Um, and when you get to Mars, uh, who is going to give you your air? Who is going to well, give you Elon your water? Musk is. Um, if your boss is terrible. <laughs> what's HR gonna do for you? So there's a lot of questions that are, <laughs> that um, I'm just really, really fascinated by. You know, when, when, when uh, Natalie is like, oh, I got three months, at, uh, three weeks added on to my, my indenture because mm -hmm. I had to have a bandage. And like, I'm just like, oh, so mad. <laughs> Yeah, and you don't think of it as like when, when I, I, I remember writing that, going, "Oh my God, is that true?" And then I looked at my own medical bill for for um, when I had my baby. I got the medical bill, and it was uh, twenty five thousand um, dollars. If I hadn't had insurance, it cost twenty five thousand dollars. And there was this thing in there. It was like it was like uh, forty dollars for for this bandage that I had to have, and I'm just like. So, so a, a lot of the stuff in there, you look at it and you go, that, that can't be real, but it's real. It happens to people every day in our society. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> do you think maybe we could do a reading right now? 
I think this might be a good time because we've just talked about some world building. Okay, um, I'm actually going to read a section that I haven't read before. So this is from the middle of the book. It's not all that spoilery. Um, it is from the point of view of Three Seagrass, who I mentioned earlier, who is at the moment on a Texcalanli military ship and has had a really bad fight with Mahit, who is the primary protagonist. Um, and I will start there. The Karanian kitten didn't like being carried in any way three seagrass could come up with carrying a kitten. Holding it by the scruff of its neck seemed rude, especially since she didn't exactly know when she was going to get to put it down, and cradling it like it was a human infant made it puncture her with all of its many, many claws. Eventually, she stopped carrying it and let it sit on her shoulder instead, which it seemed to enjoy. There was still some puncturing involved, but it was less malicious and more stability-oriented. She still had no idea what to do with it. There was absolutely no way she could bring it to the room she was supposed to share with Mahit, and she didn't want to go there anyway. Not yet. Maybe not at all. In the city, this would be when she'd find herself a decent bar and an interesting stranger to amuse herself with for a while. Maybe there were bars and strangers on fleet ships. There would absolutely be strangers. Possibly a stranger would like a Koranian kitten. Three seagrass could hold out hope. She asked her cloud hook to direct her to the nearest location that was both recreational and not a fitness and training facility. She could think of nothing she wanted to do less than exercise, stars, and followed where it led her, which wasn't a bar, exactly. It probably would have been a bar if it wasn't on a fleet ship. There were tables and music, something Three Seagrass dimly remembered had been popular last winter with a lot of synthesizers in, and dimmer lighting than in the corridors and lots of strangers, and even some food that wouldn't have been out of place in a bar. Fried noodles, maize kernels soaked in spices and vinegar, cassava chips. What there wasn't was alcohol. No getting drunk on your off shift, apparently. Not on the fleet's credit chip, at least. Everyone was sober which meant everyone turned to look at her when she walked in. It was fairly gratifying. Three Seacrest could imagine the picture she made. Information envoy in coral orange, the brightest uniform in this sea of fleet gray and gold with a kitten on her shoulder. An absurd picture, possibly a threateningly absurd one. Hi, she said brightly. What kind of food is the best here? For me and also for this creature. There was a resounding silence. Three Seagrass waited for it to shatter. It always did. Curiosity and interest would win every time if she was just patient enough and expressed sufficient bravado. Still, the 10 seconds of detent were excruciating. Then a woman who had been sitting alone along the not a bar, she was wearing the rank sigils of a quick lihuili, a specialist officer of some kind, said, hot fried noodle cake. Why have you got a cat, envoy? And the whole room relaxed. The adjutant gave it to me, said Three Seagrass, and took the empty seat beside the quick Lakuli. Do you want it? It seems very friendly, if sharp on the ends. No, said the quick Lakuli. I definitely don't want a Karanian kitten, and held out her arms for it. Three Seagrass felt a sharp pang of recognition. This person knew exactly how to take control of a conversation, combine surprise and confusion and generosity to engender rapid trust. How nice, someone trained in basic interrogation, like finding a lost a secret a sibling on a fleet ship. She coaxed the kitten off her shoulder and let it settle on the quick Lahuli's knee, where it transformed itself into an ovoid of contentedly vibrating black fur and claws. I'm Three Sigra, she said, once freed of animalian encumbrances. Are you serious about the noodle cake or are you trying to make the information spook look bad via capsaicin poisoning? I'm serious about the noodle cake, unless you're especially sensitive to capsaicin poisoning, envoy. The Quelaculi sketched a bow over her fingertips without dislodging the kitten. 14 spike of the scout gunner knife points ninth blooming, 10th legion. We don't poison spooks, unless necessary. Knife Point's ninth blooming was the ship which had brought back the transmission of hideous alien noises. Maybe Three Seagrass had picked the right recreation area after all, even if there wasn't any alcohol to be served. She said, 
thank you in two formality modes higher than what she'd been using before and watch 14 Spike figure out why she was being thanked. It didn't take that long. Definitely a trained negotiator, a spy even, a fleet spy that, that hardly mattered. You're using that recording, said 14 Spike, the one knife point took before we got chased back here. Good fucking luck, Envoy. I speak five languages and that stuff isn't language. Chrissy Gras nodded. I've noticed, she said, but information makes a habit of speaking to the unspeakable, so one has to try, no? Better you than us. Five languages. What do you use those for on a scout gunner? There was an art to this, like playing a handball game against a new opponent, gauging skill and speed, but all with words. It was what three seagrass was for. It was so much easier than thinking about Nahib Desmar. 14 Spike shrugged a fractional amused motion and said, talking, we do that. Even in the fleet, it isn't reserved for spooks. She had begun petting the Karanian kitten and it purred like it wanted to be a starship engine when it grew up. Oh, I've heard that the third palm of the fleet is very good at talking, Bruce Seagrass said, matching that shrug exactly, and was surprised, delightedly surprised, when 14 Spike's face went still and quiet and cold. Not just the third palm, she said. Forgive my ignorance, Bruce Seagrass told her and left her the opening to explain herself. She suspected 14 Spike wouldn't be able to resist. She'd touched some nerve, some place of pride at the core of her, and she'd defend it, and Three Seagrass would know something new. We're the 10th Legion, not third palmers, said 14 Spike. We don't need political officers to get our missions done. If you understand me, Envoy. Unspoken but obvious, we don't need information either. And more importantly, the 10th Legion under Nine Hibiscus really, really didn't like being ordered around by the third palm of the Ministry of War. Such a good reading, such a good excerpt. I love that scene. I wanted to be in that. I wanted to hear all the conversation that happened after you cut away to the next scene. I'm like, I oh. know I wanted to write it, but it would have been like achingly self-indulgent. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm really fond of that scene. It's, it's not a throwaway, like it's not, um, it's actually relatively plot bearing, but it's, it's actually one of the scenes that I added in the major revision I did at the, um, I underwrite chronically. So usually my first drafts are missing about somewhere between a quarter and a third of the book. Um, and then my editor tells me all of the places that I think I've told people what's going on and she has no idea. Um, and I put in things. So this was one of the things I added. And it started out being, well, how do I get this person, Three Seagrass, from place A to place B? Because I have not told anyone what happens. And there's a missing, like, seven hours of time, which is weird. So, and then it turned into something that let me do several other fun things. And I really enjoy 14 Spike, who also deserves more of a story than she gets. That's wonderful. Thank you for the reading. Um, Karen, can you, uh, can you, can you give us something awesome too? Sure. I, I just have to say that the purring like a kitten purring like a starship engine, that's one of my favorite lines out of any book anywhere in the history of books. Uh -huh. It's just, oh, it's so good. Like it just says everything about the engine, the cat, the situation. Oh, it's just, anyway, I'm, I, I, I very, very well done. So I, I'm going to read from the second chapter of uh, Engines of Oblivion, where Natalie Chan, who has gotten everything she's wanted, um, she's a citizen now, she runs her own department, and that department is working on using Vi weapons to, uh, to, to uh, get the company's goals done in war. And they're currently at war, they need to um, take this complex on bittersweet, and Natalie has figured out a way to use a Vi weapon to do it without spilling any blood or on either side um, because she's seen enough of it in her life. She's done. Um, so, uh, but unfortunately being the director, having all that power still isn't enough because she can still get uh, overruled. And uh, that is about to happen. But she didn't disconnect from the proxy rig. 
She closed her eyes, but the ingest quality render bot Scanio had re recommended for the suit slammed the visuals straight into her brain. The drugs dragged her deeper into eyes wide consciousness. She'd seen some shit working the ordnance teams in the Vi War. Catter reactors making peach fuzz of people's eyes and read out stars sending unholy fire through carotid arteries. She'd seen the gas of the greenhouse bomb on the battlefield at Cana snacking on soldiers' lungs and making soup of her bunkmate's bones. She'd seen the blue screamer itself and the way it slipped up the spine, twisting the person apart with the vertebrae. She'd seen her friends die like this on planet after planet and on tribulation itself but the redshift star. No one, nobody has seen a redshift star work. Nobody lived that long around a redshift star to know how it worked. Natalie shook, violent, nauseous. Somewhere inside, she knew this had been inevitable. Applied kinetics was all about the hope that wild vi kinetics could be controlled and used in conventional warfare. But this murder hadn't been the plan. Her mission was supposed to go a completely different way. The plan had been to take the base with the EMP, then use the ready platoon to secure their weapons labs. Even now that seemed off, stupid. Bolt fire could damage the lab's operational capacity, but the redshift star. The star rolled out from the puppet's stomach cavity onto the ground with a muffled thump, like a badly aimed soccer ball. The roughly spherical weapon had a pockmarked surface more, than an, more like an asteroid or a stone than a ball of gas. It bumped to a stop at the foot of the leader and split in half. He was the first to go and he went screaming. The red light slipped out from the weapon and shattered in 16 directions. Red light shot up his legs, slithered under his fingernails, flayed his skin, turned him into strips and finally into a fine red dust that twisted in a hot electric current. The others turned to run. She watched from her knees calling to get me out, get me out, get me out. But they pushed more drugs into her IV and the thrum of reality was so loud, banging around in her ears like gunfire. Rooted to the spot, she watched the Baywells die, cracked by red light, twisted apart into dust. Above, she gulped down sweet air, Vancouver air. She was losing immersion. She knew she was on the planet at the center of the furnace, standing in the middle of a tornado of red and gold dust. But she was also back home, staring down her father on the winter swept plaza and occupying a tiny slab bed on a troop transport going to Cana and breathing back on London with ash and the dead and the dust and smiling across the 25 mess at a man she didn't recognize. Which was fucked up because there hadn't been a man on 25. But the break didn't last. The humans before her turned from skin and bones into blood and dust, brief flares and candles, little explosions that burned bright and burst into darkness, the small bursts of wind sending the dust that was left into fading spurts around the landing gears and tailpieces of the abandoned fighter craft. They were dying before her too, the indentures who worked this mine, the innocents and the misfortunes, the Ashlands, the Natalies, people who knew that going corporate was the only way to get off starving earth. She remembered the alien on the concrete floor of the bug out bay on tribulation, Ash telling her that there's no such thing as a single Vi, even as her gun spun hot, even as the inhuman silver blood swirled around her feet. They didn't know we could die, she'd said, but Natalie knew. Natalie should have known this too. She swayed where she stood, choking on a helpless anger hot enough to burn, struck with the inevitability of it all. Here she was, messing around with proxy rigs and kinetic weapons and other expensive bullshit, when Aurora had simply chosen the rawest of Auroran solutions, one that was efficient, effective, and cheap. Natalie would have thought about it herself, except she'd been to tribulation. She'd seen efficiency when Ash triggered the London weapon, seen the blank-eyed bodies spinning in their tombs, just alive enough to breathe. She'd been efficiency down in that bug out bay, the Vi that had, had attacked Ash bleeding out at her feet. And it had been stupid, stupid, stupid of her to think that the Aurora executive board would actually leave the outcome of this battle up to a platoon of soldiers with guns when a more efficient solution was offered. The noise tapered after a moment and she placed her borrowed fingers against the ground, imagining what was happening below. You're a monster. A new voice. She whirled. The voice belonged to a man with brown eyes, close cropped black curls, blue work pants, and an, an, and an alien attack squad swag shirt tied around his arms. He'd been standing behind Natalie the entire time, barehanded and bareheaded, 
as if he wasn't afraid of the proxy and the power crackling around her stolen body at all. The air on Bittersweet wasn't breathable, but he stood without a cold suit, his chest rising and falling. Her own suit still crackled with bright red light, fizzled and snapped with it. He wasn't real. He couldn't be real, she thought, unless the last time she'd seen a human being survive the demolition of a biokinetic, it had been ash back on tribulation. She'd been lined in blue, the light shoved down her throat, sparkling death at her heart. She'd lived. She'd lived because of what was done to her here on Bittersweet, below the surface of this cursed world. Who are you? She croaked. The man met her eyes across the distance. You're a monster, he whispered again. It's not my fault. I didn't do this. Her stomach crawled with unwanted guilt. It's never your fault, is it? Natalie's world twisted and a liquid knot under her skull snapped as if enough of the drugs had worn off to make her finally realize that this was wrong. This was not her body that they'd hijacked it to commit a war crime that she just, she just, oh God, she just. And the scratching yellow dust of bittersweet spun away from her, fading from gold to black. The last thing she saw was the man still watching as she collapsed, still alive, even after an entire world turned to dust. I love that scene. It's so insane. The, what, what they do to her and like what, what she discovers in that scene sort of discovers what she does. I mean, and it has such implications for the rest of the novel. I'm well, there's so, so much in it. There's so much in it. Like I, I, I want, P, I, I want to scream like, go back and read it again when you're done. <laughs> Really but I can't do that because I'm I'm polite. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad you read that one. That's really awesome. Um, I do have a I have a, a general question and that'll make your eyes roll. When did you realize you were writing a series? I realized it when Natalie didn't get from A to Z. Um, in the first book, I uh, in the first book, um, Ash Ash and Kate are my are, are my favorites. They are they they are the loves of my life, really, honest to God. But they go from um, they go from the beginning of their story to the end of their story in in kind of one book. Um, and meanwhile, Natalie is stuck at F or or G or even N. Um, she's just stuck there, and I, I I couldn't leave her there. I just couldn't. And so I thought about what happened next and I'm just like, oh, of course, of course that it all kind of unfolded from there. And, and I knew it had to be a series. Yeah, I'm so, I'm, I'm so, I'm so glad that you did. Um, was it an easy, uh, like, did you go in? I'm, I'm, I wanna ask a couple writer questions too and I'm gonna ask Arkady too. Did you go into a discussion <clears throat> when you, uh, I think this is your, uh, the, uh, the first one was um, uh, your first book. This is your second book, right? So when you sold your first book or when you got an agent, did you go in going, I got a series, I got a series, or, or well, did it, you have to let, <laughs> let that information come out gently? I, I wanted it to be a series, but... Um... I, I, I wanted to have something published a little more. So uh, what I did was I put an ending on, on the first book. Um, and I like that myself e even. I, I, I don't really like cliff, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really like, like cliffhangers as much as, as I say I do. I like to have, I, I like my characters to have arcs and, and settle into places at the end and feel very, um, and have them feel very, uh, um, um, and, 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 and have everyone feeling satisfied at the end yeah, of the book. So the to conclude. Sure. Yeah. So it, you, you, you can stop at the end of Architects of Memory. I don't know why you would. Well, why would you? Absolutely. <laughs> and now what about you, Arkady? When did you know you were writing a series? Um, when did I know for sure when my agent sold the book? Um, when did I have an idea of what I could do next about two thirds of the way through A Memory Called Empire? Where I was like, okay, if I write more in this universe, I know what that's gonna be about and like how it, functionally how it's gonna go. Um, kinda knew the end, kinda didn't. But similarly to Karen, I really like books that close. You can read A Memory Called Empire and stop and it is very, very one arc complete. Yeah. It's not the entirety of that arc. It's sort of like a, a phrase with two beats in it. Um, a Memory Called Empire and A Desolation Called Peace are really two halves of a duology, which is not to say that I'm not gonna write more Takes Kalan books, but they're not gonna be so directly in sequence. 
Um, these two are really two halves of one conceptual story with two complete stories in them. So I knew that that was a possibility when I was writing, but I had basically decided that until I sold the book, I certainly wasn't going to write a sequel to an unsold book. Why would I do that? That is probably not a good use of my time and energy. And the the story was done. Like you can stop there and I don't want you to, but yeah. I understand if you want to, that's okay. When my agent sold the book, the editor we sold it to asked if there was another one. And I said, there can be, when do you want it by? And <laughs> therefore we sold two books. Then I had to go write one, which was interesting. <laughs> Oh yeah, number two is always so interesting. Hmm. So um, you know what's worse? Three, especially if it's in a different universe. Oh no! <laughs> Don't say it! Don't say it! <laughs> you know, as, as a lover of of your books, Arcady, I I feel bad for you, but also I'm like, yeah, just write it for me, please. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, it's really flattering. That's not going to help you sleep at night as you're trying to put together storylines, but um, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So I want to ask another writerly question. And Karen, I was wondering if you can start with this one because uh, tell me, do you have a favorite place to write and how do you make time to write? And I'm <laughs> super curious about this. I love asking writers this question because it's so, it's so uh, diverse. And plus you learn all kinds of interesting things about their crazy lives, how they balance everything. Go tell me. Well, I, I, I have to say this first, I have a toddler. Um, she's currently 20 months old at this at this time and it's a pandemic. And so my husband and I basically play this, um, you know, game of, of toss the toddler back and forth. Um, before the pandemic, uh, there was a place near my house. I, there, there were these two coffee houses near my house um, that I absolutely loved. I knew the whole staff, I knew them they knew me, I would come in, they'd be like the usual and I'd sit down and the, I, I don't know what it was about it, but it was that wonderful third place where you felt so welcome and you could just plug in and sit down. Um, I would go every Friday and I would just like, that's where I would get most of my draft words done. Um, of course that, that, that took that, that, stopped during the pandemic. And I actually, um, I walked in maybe a month in and that's when it really settled in for me that this was happening, um, was that they had taken out the bar that, that I sat at. Um, and, uh, I would also go with some friends and we would, we would go and we'd sit and work together. And so all of a sudden I was sitting in my office here, um, all alone and, 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 and very, very, very sad about it. So I, I cannot wait to get back there. Um, but with a toddler, it's tough because I don't have that kind of um, sustained focus time that I used to. Um, even on Friday, when I would go and sit and just get it all out, I don't really have that anymore. So what I've been doing is I have been either getting up early or I stay up late. Um, my, my husband and I also play toss the toddler and sometimes I get uh, three or four hours while he watches, um, then he goes to work and I watch the toddler. Um, so I have learned to um, do something that I really needed to do. Like before I needed these long, long skeins of time. And now I can just turn it on and off, um, which is a skill I never thought I wanted or needed to have. Um, but I just sit down, open up the thing and, 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 and go. And sometimes it's like, oh, I have 10 seconds. She is playing with a, she is playing with a, um, she is playing with her favorite toy. So I grab the Alpha Smart, turn the Alpha Smart on and, and, um, jam down some words and then and then 10 seconds later it's done and I move on and um you, you do what you have to do especially in the pandemic you just have to you just have to keep on going and find what what works for you <laughs> and architects, architects of memory was written pre-baby and yes. Engines of oblivion was written post-baby am I correct yeah Engines of oblivion was um I started that the day I learned I was pregnant like serious no no like like, like it was oh, no. Yeah, I started it and then I found out and I'm like, oh, this is going to be fun and interesting. Um, I was about, I had finished the first draft um, when, when I had Claire, so nine months in. Um, and then I realized that it was very broken. 
um, it, it was a, a very broken book. And I had a conversation with my wonderful editor where I, I was like, you know what, I, I think I need to rewrite the whole second half. Um, and, and she kind of paused and said, okay. And just just went with it because I, I don't think she wanted to say it, but I knew it and she knew it. And so um, and so I rewrote the whole second half with a newborn. Um, and so if you're wondering why it's so wacky, that's that's probably it's it's filled it's just filled with excitement so maybe that's what it's like to have a newborn it's like ah we're awake we're awake we're awake we're awake i was i was so tired the whole time i was so tired i was on no sleep literally no sleep so everything was just this this shade of of neon and of course she is such a great person like the like my daughter is like the best person on earth so it's always interesting to like look at her and go like and you know and now that she's now that she's older and she can go oh i what's that and what's that and i get to explain explain things and and that's good for world building too because she doesn't know she doesn't know anything about the world so I have to show, so she'll point at a flower and I'm like oh that's just a flower but that that's the coolest thing she's ever seen so um so yeah everything was very neon and bright and and going straight through the tunnel and here we go and <laughs> um I I don't recommend it as a as a constant sort of thing but it worked for this book um thank you on behalf of all the writers out there who have to balance a million things and it's nice to hear how people actually do it and I wanted to point out that when I asked that question and so Arkady in your answer about what your favorite place to write and how you make time I just want you to know my brain has changed so much that I'm like what room is kind of what I meant so <laughs> oh, no. yeah I know yeah how about you? Well, how do you find time to write and where do you like to write I don't have a toddler, but I have a really demanding politics adjacent day job that I adore, which probably takes up not quite as much time as a toddler, but can result in very peculiar hours. Um, and I love my job and it's deeply important to me. So I consider myself as someone who's doing two careers at once, basically. Um, Again, before the pandemic, I had a schedule and a rhythm and it was great. So I would go to my office and I would stay in my office until about five-ish. And then before I went home, I would go to the coffee shop that is between my office and my flat. And I would stay there, get whatever I wanted. And either I'd write 500 words or it would be an hour, whichever was first. And if... I wanted to keep going, I could. And that was a really sustainable, even great system, which no longer functions, not even a little, because I don't go to my office. We have been work from home for more than a year now. Uh, and this makes the hours even weirder. When it was warm, I went and sat on my porch to write. And that works for me because the trick for me is often to shift where I am to like have a signal of, okay, I'm doing this now. And sitting in the same chair as I do work in to do writing in just, I'm distracted already, like sort of by virtue of being in that place. I'm not in the mode of making things with my brain. I'm in the mode of analyzing things with my brain. And I will be totally honest and say, I have screwed up deadlines this year, which is not something I've ever done before. Yeah. Um, and not something that I like saying that happened to me, but I also think it's something that's useful to share. Because I'm a really mm -hmm. deadline driven person. I'm a really ambitious person. I have a bunch of stories I'm super excited about telling and want to share with people. I'm not stuck. Like I've been writer's block before in my life. That's not this. This is the world isn't the world and there's no shape to it. And finding places to make things when there is no shape to the world is really, really hard. Um, it's getting better, possibly because the world is slowly getting better at the moment. Um, and possibly because I'm just deeply, deeply tired of not finishing this particular novella. 
but yeah, it's not been an easy year. Oh, I think it's really important to, to say those things. I, uh, I, I think that's very, very good to say, because a lot of times as, as writers, we want to look like, you know, we're, it's, it's kind of like we live in Instagram life at times when we're like, oh yes, we're doing great. I'm writing, I'm doing great. Look at like, you know, look at how good I look, look at, you know, what's going on in my life. And inside we're just, you know, roiling balls of insecurity and doubt. And, <laughs> and it's good, it's good for people to know that, um, that that sort of thing happens to real writers. Like I had to ask for an extension too. When I, when I did the rewrite, it was just, I had to do it. And yeah, sometimes you just have to. The last deadline I hit on time was the edit for Desolation, but that was at the beginning of the pandemic when it was still like, okay, I have reserves. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Ooh, then reserves. because, because publishing schedules are strange. I finished the book in like April of 2020. It doesn't come out, like finished the edit yeah. in April of 2020 and it doesn't come out until early March of 21. Mm -hmm. So it was a very weird gap of people think I've been super productive in those 11 months and they are wrong. <laughs> no, it's Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Arkady. Um, it's really, as a writer, it's really good to hear because we all have our challenges this particular year in addition to what may already exist. So it's really nice of you to, to tell everyone um, that, that, that that happened to you too. And um, Karen, it's really good to tell everyone how you balance. When I talk with other writers, these are all things that they bring up, the balance and the external challenges. So thank you. And I think, um, I think it's time to wrap up. I wanna say very specifically, thank you so much to both of you for writing these books for pouring your hearts into them um and for plowing through the publishing process and getting it done um you know with gaps or without i don't really care they're wonderful books and it's really nice of you to take time um at the gaithersburg book festival to uh talk with everyone um so thank you so much i'd like to thank you for joining us today for this presentation we have an amazing lineup of author presentations taking place right here throughout the month of May. You don't want to miss them. Go to gaithersburgbookfestival.org and look over the schedule so you can plan the rest of your festival month. And now here's an important message from renowned author and independent bookstore owner, Ann Patchett and her dog, Sparky. Enjoy everyone. I'm Ann Patchett here at Parnassus Books with my dog Sparky, and I wanna tell you the importance of supporting your local independent bookstore, Politics and Prose. They are a remarkable partner with this book festival. Now, when a book festival is live, it's really easy. You just go to the table and you buy your book and then you go to the event. But when a book festival is virtual, it gets a little trickier because you're home and you might think, well, you know, I'll just buy the book on Amazon. So I'm here to tell you, don't buy the book on Amazon. For one thing, Jeff Bezos has enough money, right? He's trying to colonize the moon or something. He doesn't need anything that you've got. Politics and Prose, on the other hand, they're your local independent bookstore and you love them and they bring you so many events. They work harder than any bookstore I know in their community. And if you want them to be there alive and healthy and well when all this is over, you actually need to support them. They are the people that are putting a tax base in your community, okay? So you have teachers and police officers and firefighters, and when you pay a couple dollars more for a book, you're creating jobs in your community. So. Enjoy your book festival, support politics and prose. Remember, Ann Patchett and Sparky think it's the thing to do. Shop local. Thank you. <laughs>